Uh, welcome to the ESIP ITNI um, monthly presentation. Um, this is also in conjunction with the USGS CBI Tech Stack Working Group. So I um, want to welcome um, our, our group of presenters. We're pleased to host Joe Colgan, Paco Bansisting, and Kenzie Turner. They're from the USGS Geosciences and Environmental Change Science Center. Uh, located in Denver, uh, along with a lot of us uh, on Denver Federal Center in Lakewood. Um, they're going to be providing a, an overview of the geologic framework of the Intermountain West uh, initiative. And uh, we're really excited to see both the platform and the interface and the data resource that they have put together. Um, it's been a, a good collaborative relationship uh, between NG Talk and uh, Guest. So let's um, switch over to our presentation at this point. I think we've got that queued up and we should have uh, Joe Colgan on video to set. Okay, um, just get the slides up on screen and I can start. You got that going, Kenzie? Yep, getting there. Okay. <laughs> Kenzie has started. That's Woo. good. All right. Okay, and we're in the um, we're in the mode where you can see uh, the whole uh, PowerPoint. Right. And now we're gonna go cycle through them all. Are you doing? Uh, are you seeing presentation mode right now? Yes. Or, yeah, the presenter view with the there. There we go. This is the one we want. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Uh, in this uh, work we're going to talk about has been conducted um, you know, under the umbrella of this Intermountain West Geologic Framework Project, which uh, started a few years ago. Um, myself and Ren Thompson are the project chiefs. Kenzie is one of the working group leads and a whole a very large now cast of characters working on this. Um, I haven't counted up all the names recently, um, but you know, probably getting 20 or so people, uh, which is a very big project for the mapping program. And looking at this list, gosh, I think fully a third of those people are people we've onboarded remotely uh, during COVID. So it's been quite a year. Um, uh, but we're, yeah, we're really excited to talk about this. So, uh, but first, uh, I'm going to just talk very generally a little bit about what geologic maps are. Um, so we make geologic maps, and we're going to talk about sort of new ways to make them and deliver them to people. Um, and I'm sure everyone has seen one, uh, but next slide, please, Kenzie. So according, I'm cutting off the bottom, but whatever. Um, uh, according to the geologic mapping program, geologic maps are maps that show the distribution, composition, and age of rocks and sediments. They show other things too, but that's a pretty good definition. Um, Dave Soller on his NGMDB page claims that they are the most requested scientific product produced by state and federal geological surveys, which I believe um, there's a, a lot of uses for them. People have been making geologic maps for a really long time. Um, the first map sort of widely recognized as, as being something like a modern geologic map is Smith's geologic map of England, Scotland, and Wales made in 1815. Um, and you can see there, the, the UK um, and different types of rock, different ages and compositions are shown by different colors on the map corresponding to where you can find those rocks on the ground. And that is still the basic principle by which these maps are made. Uh, the popular science writer Simon Winchester wrote a sort of popular science book about that map called The Map That Changed the World. Uh, gosh, 10, 10 years ago or so. It's an entertaining read if you're into the history of geology or science or, or mapping. Um, and, and, you know, by, you know, 100 years ago or even, even more, uh, geologic maps had essentially reached, you know, the, the form that you're familiar with. If, if you look at one now, um, I've got a clip on the right side of the screen from uh, Peach and Horn's famous map of the Ascent District in Scotland. And when I say famous, I mean among like structured, structural geology nerds, um, not among the general public. Um, they essentially invented the concept of thrust faults uh, in the course of that mapping. Uh, but the map they produced looks like a modern geologic map. It has rock units denoted by colored polygons separated by 
lines denoting faults or depositional contacts and so forth. There are little point symbols on there showing, you know, which way the beds are dipping and various other things. You can see it's on a, a base map that has, you know, roads and various things on it. Uh, so, you know, geologic maps look very similar today to the way they have for a long time. And, you know, remember a hundred years ago, people had no idea how old the earth was. They didn't know what plate tectonics was. They didn't know any of that. You know, they just went around observing what kinds of rocks were there and, and making maps showing that. So next slide. So how are geologic maps made? Um, you know, the first thing to, you know, remember and, and keep in mind, especially when we get to Kenzie's part of the talk is that maps, you know, have been and still are made on a quadrangle by quadrangle basis or county by county or whatever sort of circumscribed area uh, is of interest. And each one is unique. Uh, that is, you know, the geology that's portrayed within that box, uh, you know, one person or persons decided exactly how they were going to divide the rocks and the earth up and draw lines around them and show them on the map. And somebody mapping right next door or even in the same area at a different time uh, almost always makes those decisions differently. Um, and so, you know, no two maps sort of look the same or fit together. I mean, even if it's the same earth that people are looking at. So geologic mapping starts the way people have always done it. Um, it's a field-based observational process. Um, go out to the field, hike around, look at all the rocks, uh, and then uh, draw, you know, lines around what you're going to call the units on some type of base map there. I've got a little clip of an air photo uh, with little lines on it. And that's actually not even that long ago. That was how I learned to do it when I was a student on paper air photos or, or topographic maps. People are starting to use tablets these days, but the process is the same. For those of us who are into geologic mapping or got into that as, as a career, it's that uh, the picture of the people standing on top of the mountain that was the appeal for a lot of us. You know, you're studying to go to med school and it dawns on you that somebody somewhere conceivably might pay you to go hiking and look at rocks. Um, and before you know it, you're off to graduate school. And then, you know, 15 or 20 years later, wondering what went wrong with your career. And then Derek asks how you feel like being an IT project manager. And it's like, oh my God, that's what happened. But uh, the next step uh, after doing all that, I don't, no, no, I don't know if anyone can see the pointer, but um, uh, after making field observations, collecting laboratory data and things like that, uh, that all goes into a, a GIS database. And this is really the only big difference between how maps were made say 50 years ago. Uh, but for the most part, and even still now, GIS databases for geologic maps uh, have been, and in many cases still are, used primarily as a cartographic tool. Um, you know, the goal is to get to that printed, published map. I mean, usually they're PDFs now in lieu of actually printing them. Um, but the, the GIS database is usually just a stop along the way, uh, and that the printed product is considered definitive. Uh, next slide, Kenzie. Um, something to remember about geologic maps that are different from other types of geospatial data is the way that they scale. Um, you can take the actual earth and then make a detailed geologic map of it. There I'm just showing some 1 to 24,000 scale mapping, which is sort of the de facto detailed standard for geologic maps. Uh, but then, you know, unlike, say, uh, you know, some gridded topographic product or something, uh, that there's no sort of automatic or algorithmic way that you can zoom out and, and scale that to something less detailed. Uh, if you're going to do that, we call that regional compilation, say taking a bunch of detailed maps and then making something that's 100 or 250,000 scale. Uh, that's a very involved process that has to be done by geologic mappers deciding, you know, which of of those mini units on the map in the middle, they're gonna to lump together in color brown or blue or whatever on the less detailed map. Um, so that the compilations uh, at, at regional scales are scientific products uh, that it takes a lot of work looking through maps to produce. Next slide, Kenzie. 
Um, so we all work for the National Cooperative Geologic Mapping Program. It's a little bit different than other survey programs in that it was established by its own act of Congress, reauthorized most recently a couple of years ago, um, since the reorganization of the survey back whenever that was 10 years ago, it's part of core science systems. Um, and uh, there's a very strict formula for funding coming into that program where it goes. Half goes to what's called FedMap, which is us at the USGS to make geologic maps. Half goes to the state geological surveys. Every state has one um, and they you know, apply for their share of the money to do mapping. Uh, and then there's a little bit uh, left over that uh, goes to an educational program where we give grants to students to make geologic maps. Um, so it's a joint, you know, you know, by law, you know, and budget, it, it's a very much a joint federal state enterprise. You know, we were always interacting with the state geological surveys. So next slide, Kenzie. Um, and the National Cooperative Geologic Mapping Program put together a new strategic plan. Um, came out of a conference they had in Denver four years ago or so. And I just found out that this has been published like literally this week, I think. Uh, it's up on the NCGMP website. Um, and they articulated several goals and I checked goal three is still identical in the published version. The one of interest to us is about creating seamless geologic maps within user defined AOIs across all of the country by 2030. <clears throat> and we're gonna set aside the 2030 part because uh, that's more than just our group in Denver can handle. Um, but we did put together this fairly large project uh, to look at how you would go about synthesizing a bunch of geologic maps into a seamless database uh, for a large region, you know, fast enough that you could conceivably, if not the country, cover a fairly large area in a reasonable amount of time. Next slide, Kenzie. Um, and, you know, put graphically, the problem can basically be stated uh, you know, we've been mapping the U.S. for over 100 years now. There are thousands of geologic maps out there made at different times, different scales for different reasons. And like I mentioned earlier, you know, every one is, is unique into itself. So if you zoom anywhere into the National Geologic Map database, you'll get something that looks like, like this. Uh, this is just the San Juan Mountains. You know, you have this patchwork of more and less detailed maps uh, sort of lying haphazardly across the landscape. And, you know, it's uh, the challenge uh, to synthesize that into something that, that actually makes sense and is seamless across all these borders. So next slide. So that's just our uh, shot of our database across that area where, you know, we've gone through all those maps and taken the best from each one uh, and tied it together uh, in this digital map database. Um, and next slide. Um, so uh, we're calling this a regional seamless intermediate scale and open-ended database. Uh, these are just some of the terms that get thrown around by us and by the states and by other people and people don't always mean the same thing. Um, but you know, by regional, we mean we're shooting for a large area, not just like a couple quadrangles or something. Seamless means no breaks along the map boundaries. Um, only, you know, geologically meaningful contacts. We're gonna pull everything together so you're not just looking at, at the patchwork anymore. Intermediate scale means one to 100,000 where we can get it, either compiling it ourselves or getting it from uh, where it's already been done. That's kind of the, uh, the best balance of regional coverage and detail uh, that, that you can get. But we're going to patch the holes with less detailed maps uh, where we need to in between those areas. Um, Open-ended is one of the, Kenzie will talk more about this, is one of the biggest differences and challenges with what we're doing uh, as opposed to the way a traditional map would be made where uh, you are starting out with 24K quadrangle or 100K quadrangle or a county or something that has a border on it. It's your job to make a map that covers that area and only that area. And so you're only concerned about making your stratigraphy and everything else work within that area, not uh, areas uh, you know, that are adjacent to it or far away or anything else. Uh, but for what we're doing, 
uh, I mean, yes, technically, you could draw a line around the entire United States and say, you know, this is the border of where we're going, but we can't make some, you know, a map that big with that much detail all at once. Um, you know, this is something where we have to do a little chunk and then add to it over time and get it to grow. Um, so we have to have a way to do it, you know, and a, both a process and a database where we can keep adding things, keep the seamless, keep all the stratigraphy hanging together, uh, you know, we're, we're without sitting down at the beginning and just making every decision that needs to be made because we don't, wouldn't even know where to start. Next slide. So the actual Intermountain West project um, started in fiscal 19 uh, is organized to cover uh, a transect across the Cordillera, sort of at the four corners latitude. Uh, the blocks are uh, 250K quadrangle boundaries. Uh, like I said, we're, we're actually targeting 100K for the geology. Uh, it was just a convenient way to show it. Um, we chose an east-west transect to give us a big footprint. So no cheating, we have to reckon with a big area right up front. Um, meant then, you know, going east-west, uh, the geology changes east-west much more than it does north-south. Uh, so that'll uh, give us a great sample of just about everything you say outside of the Cascades uh, that you, you might find geologically in the Western US. And so the concepts that we work out there should be more broadly applicable. Um, so the goals of the project are both to actually build this database and to figure out how to do it efficiently. Um, so we're gonna, gonna figure it out as we're doing it um, and you know, keep doing research and, into the geologic evolution of the Cordillera. Next slide. And this is just the latest you know, of our little schematic of how we envision this working. Um, you know, we're doing this data synthesis part uh, in a new database framework that Kenzie's gonna talk about. Um, and then you know, that has to go through a review process, which we've just started to reckon with now, uh, and then be delivered you know, however it's gonna be delivered. And, and uh, the product on demand option is the reason uh, we got uh, connected with Derek in the first place. Um, you know, so, but we have not really reckoned in detail with, with how this is gonna be delivered uh, yet. You know, that's, that's to come. We're just getting to the review part for, for the first chunks of data. Next slide. Can't remember if that was the last one I had, Kenzie, or not. Yep, okay. Yeah. Okay, so I, I, I'm going to dive into the details, a little more details about the, our, our GIS environment and the database schema design that we've uh, come up with to solve some of our problems. And, and what I find is the easiest way to relay that is to compare it to kind of a, a traditional approach. And so a, a traditional project you would have a fixed um, footprint. So uh, over to the right there, you see the, the Alamosa one to 100,000 K sheet. And, you know, that would be your project extent or, or maybe even a little bigger, but within that, uh, you would operate within those confines. And so there's some advantage just to having a fixed boundary is that you have a limited number of map units the geologic variability, although it can be complex, it's, it's still fairly limited uh, g given the, you know, the small size of the footprint. And then in terms of the published mapping that you have to pull upon, you may have, have quite a few, like, like you see off to the far right there, but, but it's still fairly limited. And so our our limited spatial extent relates to several other limits as well. And then generally speaking, this would be targeted as a scientific and based investigation map and would be, the data would be released on, um, on science base as a standalone file geodatabase. And so our traditional workflow, you would have a group of people working on this project, you know, maybe anywhere from five to 15 people for some of the larger projects. And they would be responsible for either a particular area or a particular rock type. Um, 
generally there would be like a surficial group and then maybe a volcanic or igneous group and then a metamorphic group, for instance, or um, then, then some people who are responsible for all parts of it. But those would be, their contributions would be passed through a lead compiler. And, you know, in the distant past, although not too distant, it would be either on a, a drawn up uh, mylar sheet or, or paper hard copies of quadrangles. And, but more recently, um, oftentimes it's standalone file geodatabases that get passed around. Um, and then that lead compiler is responsible for taking all those different components, tying it all together, adding an element of consistency in terms of the detail and the approach to how units are described and, and so on and so forth. And that's published as our graphic representation uh, that we see on the far right there. Uh, and, and like I said, as, as part of that publication, it would be accompanied by a standalone file geodatabase. For a project this size, and potentially as it scales up to the country, the we have a fairly large extent. And as Joe mentioned in there uh, earlier, the 2030 time frame means we have a very short time frame to be doing all this. And so with our scale at around one to 100 to one to 250,000, for that size of a footprint, it's an immense amount of detail for that size of a footprint. By comparison, most state maps in the Western US tend to be around one to 500,000. So a pretty substantial improvement on the detail that we can convey. And then one of the issues or a couple of the issues associated with this is that the geologic vari variability and the published information that we have to pull upon is immense. Um, as, as Joe mentioned, we're over this one transect covering most of the geologic uh, you know, variability that you're going to see throughout the entire Western US. Um, and then as you expand that to the country, it, it obviously gets even even more. And then another thing that we need to contend with is uh, incremental and non-contiguous compilation and publication. And this is, uh, this is unusual. Usually when you have a project, it's, it's aimed at a single integrated geologic map and, and it's not split up into a bunch of different parts unless some of those parts are at different scales, like maybe a, a couple of published one to 24,000 K, um, K sheets that are then um, part of the 100 K, but that is a different product. And so this compilation process that we have here in the past, where we have multiple contributors that goes through the lead compiler, it's just not going to work. We have, we have too much to do and we have too short of a time to to do it. And so we one way to improve on that is to cut out the lead compiler, basically turn all of the contributors into their own lead compiler for that particular area. And then through cooperation of people who are working next to each other, we can integrate and remove all of the administrative and map boundaries and things like that to create a, a seamless product. So our, our existing environment is um, a traditionally versioned um, ARC, ARC server data, uh, I'm sorry, um, enterprise geo database. And we're hosting that on an on-premises server. And in the past, or at least up until pandemic time, everybody was working in the office. And so through this traditional versioning and the direct connect approach, the access to the database is pretty much as fast as it would be for any locally hosted file geo database. And so everything was, was pretty good for a while. And then the pandemic hit and uh, everybody got sent home to work, uh, telework, and the connection to our database through this direct connect was significantly hampered by the VPN and the remote desktop aspects that we need, which 
really is is fairly crippling at times because the VPN can be pretty unreliable. But then another component of this is as we scale this up to other groups within the USGS, but eventually state contributors as well, as well there's going to be a lot of um, computing demand to support this many people working in the database. And so, you know, as we move into the future, the idea is that we would move to more of a feature service based editing, which might allow us to skirt the VPN um, issues. And then for the scaling, obviously moving to a cloud is going to provide us a lot more flexibility for scaling up and scaling down versus managing or continuing to purchase new on-premise servers to support all of this. Okay, so from a database standpoint, we, we had to evaluate what we needed for this new project approach. And so we needed a way to efficiently uh, do our map compilation. We need to be able to pull in new data from different areas. Uh, we're, we're held to a standard for um, the National Cooperative Geologic Mapping Program. There's a database standard that we need to be compliant within. And then we, we wanna be able to support decentralized compilation. And I'll, I'll explain what that, that is as we go through this, it, it'll become a little more apparent. Um, and then through, you know, even in that decentralized compilation, we still want to have some consistency in our attribution. Um, so as far as our database compliance, we're, we're held to the standard of the geologic map schema. And that's, uh, it's got some limitations. I mean, it is designed that is, they describe specifically as a publication data transfer and archiving um, database design. And this is basically in conflict with virtually every part of what we need for a project. It's designed for a single geologic map and it very specifically is not for regional compilations. Uh, so, so we took that database, we, we did what we needed to do to speed things up and to acquire the, the attributes that we, we needed. And one method of speeding up the the compilation was to split this into surficial and bedrock data sets. Traditionally, those two would be integrated onto a single map and also in, the, in a single database. There, there are states who have been generating various uh, types of surficial and bedrock data sets. Uh, our approach, I think, is probably a little different than some of the uh, the examples that are out there. I mean, our these two data sets are, are completely topologically decoupled. And so this allows a superficial group to add some customization specific to their rock types to allow, um, you know, for their attributes of their rock types. And same thing for the bedrock. A, an alluvial fan has a little bit different um, attribute need perhaps than like a proterozoic quartzite. But this also speeds us up because it removes a very time consuming step where you would have to integrate the superficial data in with the bedrock data. So we think this will create two um, standalone, very useful products. And so, um, you know, in terms of the fixed extent map versus what we're doing now, here's an example of, of, of a fixed extent map. Um, from the southern Colorado, northern New Mexico area. Um, we've got that list of units, which you can see the correlation of map units. That correlation of map units uh, has a, a set number of units within it. And generally, you have a pretty good handle on what the, the number of units are and what your stratigraphic relations are going to be like throughout your project area. Uh, some of the deep details can get fairly complex, but you have a pretty good idea of your framework that you're working within. And then that correlation of map units can show some very intricate um, relationships between the stratigraphy, which is extremely important in terms of 
the usability of a geologic data set. And so we take that correlation of map units and we take those stratigraphic relationships and we, we plop them into a table where we try to preserve as much of the stratigraphy as we can. We know we're gonna lose some because we're moving into tabular form. So it's, it's difficult to show pinch outs and, and um, you know, age equivalents in, in a tabular form where you're, you're restricted to uh, individual rows. Uh, but anyway, that's kind of the, the fixed extent approach. Now with what we're doing, we start with that correlation of map units and that list of map units from one area. We put that into a table, but we can't stop there. I mean, we have, as I'm showing here, three other parts of the country that we could be pulling data in from. And this is what I mean by decentralized compilation. As this scales up, the idea is that state contributors can be working on um, map compilations in their states and, and same thing with um, other USGS offices. And that can get contributed into a single database. And so we get into this, um, this repeated cycle of continually adding map units and in the map units coupled with this uh, non-contiguous non construction of the map database proves to be one of the more challenging aspects of what we've been doing because it's just constantly evolving and that's that's completely contrary to our traditional approach uh, so in terms of the the consistency of attributes um, in that decentralized environment we're not going to take a lead compiler approach and say, here, you guys have to write your descriptions exactly like this, even though you're in the Appalachians and you guys up in the Cascades and you can do it exactly like this. We're not going to be able to do that. You can barely get two geologists on the same page. You're not going to get a hundred of them on the same page. And so one way to add some consistency is strip our map units down to the really fundamental attributes of the unit. And, and also, uh, particularly for our line, pe fe line features like contacts and faults, we try to standardize where we can to, to take out some of that inconsistency. But for our map units, uh, you know, what's it called? In, in bedrock mapping, you have a framework of stratigraphy that oftentimes is pretty well defined in areas. So formal stratigraphic names and informal stratigraphic names. Um, surficial units can be a little bit different in some parts of the country. Uh, what's it made of? So is it a sandstone or is it a shale? Is it a lava flow or is it an alluvial fan? These are all very fundamental components of those, of those map units. And then how was it made? What's the process? Was it in an ocean or was it from a volcano? And then the age, you know, when, when was it deposited or when was it in place? And so breaking these down to these fundamental attributes, we recognize we're going to be losing a lot of the very detailed information. But when you're talking about a regional compilation in this time frame, what we're retaining is significantly more than any other attempt at a national data set or really even regional data set at this scale. So the units, I had mentioned the units, uh, the map units tend to be or present one of our more challenging aspects of how to deal with this. How do we ingest map units from different parts of the country and relay some sense of stratigraphy through a table? So what we've decided is that we can break our units up into what we're calling geologic provinces. So these are distinctly different from physiographic provinces. So the, for example, the San Juan Basin has a physiographic term or is a physiographic term, but from a tectonic or geologic process standpoint, it's very specific and has a set age or time frame that that occurred within. 
So these geologic provinces, because they're limited in time, we can rank them chronologically. And so that prevents or presents a kind of high order stratigraphy and means that we can build on this sort of in a compartmentalized manner rather than needing a unified predefined stratigraphic framework for the entire country at the start of the project, which is just completely impractical for this scale. So we were using three geologic province rankings. And so they have a hierarchical relationship. So our, our most broad um, provinces are in our, our province one, and in this case, the Lake Cordillera and Orogenic Basins. As we step into um, geologic province two, we're getting a little more detailed in terms of splitting, splitting up the time of when some of these events happened within that higher order rank or province. And then when you get to the geologic province three, you start to lose some of the age relationships, but you're adding in much more uh, positional accuracy to it. So for instance, for Laramide Foreland Basins, the San Juan Basin and the Raton Basin are essentially age equivalent, but we won't be able to show age equivalence in, uh, you know, in tabular form. So there is some amount of this loss, it's a loss, but the advantage is from a, a map usage standpoint, the San Juan Basin and the Raton uh, Basin are not co-located. So those units from the Raton Basin aren't going to be um, in stratigraphic position with, physically with San Juan Basin rocks. And so it it's, becomes less of an issue at that um, more detailed rank. So within our geologic provinces, we rank our map units. And so the age equivalency aspect here, for example, the San Jose formation is essentially age equivalent to the Blanco Basin formation, the El Rito formation, and the Poison Canyon formation. Um, but within that San Juan Basin province, we can relay a, a very useful stratigraphy. And so, you know, in, in terms of the co-located units, the fact that we can break these out by age groupings, um, we may have a stack of rocks in, in a particular area that includes rocks from the Rio Grande Rift, from uh, Lake Cordillera and Orogenic Basins, and then some of the oldest rocks from early Cordillera and Orogenic Basins. And within those individual provinces, we have a rank of units but because of the rank of the provinces, we have an overall stratigraphy that we can relay to users in digital form. Um, so I think, I mean, that's really about all I wanted to cover. Know if we want to open this up for questions. Uh, did did Paco join us? I just wanted to, to see if um, anyone I'm wanted here. to add. It. I'm yeah. here, Derek. Paco, I would, want, I, yeah. Of course, of course, I would be adding the less geologic side right. of things. <laughs> uh, so, but I this is the first time I've seen this presentation. This one was great, even for me. So uh, I had a general take on all this and we've changed the structure of this several times in the last couple of years, but this one was very done pretty well, Joe and Kenzie, I think. Uh, but yeah, for, I would, I'm just gonna quickly add stuff about the GIS and data management and the enterprise side of things. Right. It was a couple of years ago, like, like was mentioned, we needed to, we needed to get all of our geologists working together at the same time. So that's why we decided to use traditional versioning. So we have 15, 20 geologists working at the same time in the enterprise geodatabase that we created. And we've had to make changes obviously throughout the years, uh, but, it, but it works. 
And the only major issue we've been running into, like Kenzie mentioned, was working from not in the office. So that's why we may be looking into using feature services and editing feature services in a different way in the future, just for the speed of things. But it, it really has been working. This, this is a new idea that we all came up with and we've gotten quite a bit done, which is pretty impressive uh, IT wise, GIS wise and geologic uh, compilation wise. I think it's really, really impressive, I think, for our team to uh, work together this way. And their next big step will be to figure out good ways to, because we need to, this to get peer reviewed, of course. So we need to find ways to share this. And I, I have several ideas. And right now I'm actually, maybe some of you are as well, I'm at the, uh, at the Esri developer conference right now online. And they, they gave, some, there's more ideas that came out of that even of how I can share this to the states to do some peer reviewing of the data that we've already created. So uh, that's, that's really about it. I and mean, if you have any questions about that side, I could help and obviously Kenzie as well. No, oh, thank, thank, thanks so much for that. Um, I, I will open up for questions just after I add a, a couple of comments. Um, as, a, as a geographer who found himself uh, in the role um, a little unexpectedly as an IT project manager, I think that's one of the, <laughs> the reasons that I connect with, with this group and, and, and Joe and Kenzie as research geologists that are really building out um, this you know, pretty impressive infrastructure in order to get to the point where they're presenting really a seamless geologic digital map um, that eventually will probably be able to encompass the entire nation. I, I think there is a, a lot in common with uh, William Smith and um, the, the first geologic map of uh, really the, the British Isles in, in that um, you, you go about doing this particular endeavor without fully understanding how difficult it might be or um, what unintended consequences and benefits this is gonna bring. Right, you had you know kind of this initiative as it gets started, overcome a lot of hurdles, and then as you see it build out, uh, you know I'm I'm just seeing so so many benefits that this brings from multi-user contribution to a really truly a, a seamless uh, data platform that is updated on the fly, and that eventually might be able to connect to something like um, our U.S. scope of product on demand, and um, uh, I really want to thank you. It's hard to find that connection between earth science data and tech stack. And, and you, you, your group did it wonderfully uh, to provide us with the subject matter expertise, the uh, data system, the interoperability, and, um, and finally the, uh, the product that we're looking at. So, so um, really wanna commend the, the team on that. And I'm amazed at how, how much you've grown, right? Um, the number of staff members that you've added is really impressive during this period. Yeah, and I actually think the timing of this project was pretty good in a technological stent, uh, sense because, because of the way everything is now much more shareable and uh, services and, and, and that it's, it's much, this, the time is right for what we're doing, I think. And of course, working with you guys, this, it's, the shareability of this is going to be great with, with the services and publishing and things like that. So. So when you spin this up on Kubernetes in the cloud after gathering everything that you learn at the uh, at, at the Esri um, Combine, it, it'll be great to see what what other ideas you have going forward. Yeah, that's funny. The the Kubernetes thing was just talked about today. Maybe you saw that. Oh, we we saw the blog post. So I, I got really excited and so did a lot of people on the team. Any questions out there? Kind of want to just open it up to the floor. Um, if anybody wants to come off mute and ask the group some questions, would be great. And Megan, let me know if there's anything in chat. I have some questions. If there aren't, aren't any on, I don't see any on the it, floor right it, now. Yep, oh, go ahead. Does it does look like there's one in the chat. I'm not sure if we okay. can just discuss this, but it seems like the geological province method unlocks map layer, even 3D potential that a flat paper map can't. Could you talk about those advantages? Yeah, I can't see you on talk or you on me too. Um, yeah, you go ahead and start. 
Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, the geologic province system as a way of, of organizing, you know, all these disparate geologic units, you know, does not, doesn't in itself really add more, like more 3D to one of these maps than sort of isn't there already just from sort of the interaction of the units and the, and the topography. Um, we didn't talk about this today because we were mainly focused on the sort of the geology as, that, as it goes into the database. Um, but we have uh, people on the team working on actual 3D geologic models of a lot of this area as well. Um, you know, a lot of that work goes back to water resources work that predates this project. Um, you know, but we are just now that we've got some of this database built, we are starting to look at uh, how to integrate some of what we're doing on, you know, essentially the 2D like geologic map database with these actual 3D geologic models. Um, you know, it's tricky because uh, the 3D models are much, much more generalized uh, than the, the, the mapping that shows what's at the surface, you know, because subsurface data in most places is more limited and you have to generalize things. Um, you know, so how do we, you know, uh, sort of get things to match up, but the, you know, that's where uh, this framework that we've come up with, uh, you know, we think it could be helpful, um, you know, where you can fit subsurface units and exposed units at the surface, which in many cases are the same thing, into the same framework, uh, you know, with the same attributes and, and everything. Um, I don't know if that, uh, if, if that's helpful. I guess I would add to that one advantage to the geologic province structure is I feel like it gives a, a better um, better usability of, of the time component. Um, so, uh, you know, it's easier to search based on your, you know, the time almost, it's almost a 4D database. Not that any geologic map isn't 4D in the sense that it includes time, but the searchability through these large tectonic events, uh, I think is a step in the right direction above what you know, our traditional approach. Yeah, I think, I think that the way you guys are building this is finally a potentially a seamless database for the whole US or major regions. It certainly is going to help people. And it's such a data, uh, such an information rich product when you guys are done, because it does, it does go so deep the way you guys are showing it province down and down and down and then more, more accurate. But this definitely will, I would believe would be a way to direct research to certain areas or even for like 3D research because this is gonna be seamless and because the querying capabilities of this huge data set are gonna be pretty strong, this could be a very, I mean, it, this is a regional thing. This is not large scale stuff. So this is, but it will help people maybe search and query our data set and to get to areas where they think they wanna do high res other research or things, things like that. It's a pretty powerful database, and or it will be a very powerful. Any other questions uh, out there? Because uh, I, I do have one. I'm looking at chat to see if anyone's coming in on this. Okay, so my, my question is: that there are a couple of different temporal aspects to geologic data, and especially with the map component. It, have you thought about how you're going to handle the historic aspect of the paper maps that you're using to input into the, the, the structure? Is there um, a, a, a mission that you have to allow users of the system to look back over time at how a particular area was represented with historic geologic maps? And then is there a way that you represent the, I guess the stratigraphy, the, the um, geologic time periods for the, the, the various layers that are represented? Yeah, so for the historical aspects and the, the published map sources that we're pulling on, 
there, there is a feature level, several in fact, feature level fields where we um, cite these previous data sources that are being used. And, and like I say, it's the feature. So every individual contact has its own citation. And in, in some cases, particularly with, with polygons, we have to concatenate many of those um, citations together, but it points back to the source data that feeds into essentially every vertices that is put or every point that is put into the database. And so through a, 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 you know, a fairly convoluted relationship approach, there's a way to relate these data such that when you select on a, um, a point or a line that has e even potentially multiple um, you know, citations to it, you can easily get to the source. Now, there won't be any sort of a, a time integration of vector data Basically, we're taking a snapshot in our database of the best understanding of the geology at this time. Right. Okay. Okay. So that, that's really almost a metadata element. That exactly. Yeah, it's a feature okay. level yeah. metadata. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, really cool. Derek, the, you know, sort of if you're the, the historical, like, you know, how many different ways has like this area been mapped? You know, if that's something someone is interested in, uh, the, you know, the NGMDB that the program already serves, you know, would be the place to go to look, uh, to look for that. Because, um, uh, you know, you, you can get all, you know, see which, which maps are, are from a given area. Uh, where, like Kenzie said, we just take the best available when it comes to actually doing the work, you know, turning it into seamless vectors. Right. Thanks for that. And if you don't mind, at, at, you know, I'll collect the links um, for for these resources that, that are available and, uh, and just get that out in the group where we can put that into the uh, presentation abstract. Okay. Be really good for this audience. Sure. All right. Any any other questions from from the floor before we bring this presentation to a close? I'll just throw out that if anyone out there listening knows how to get this system to work, you know, get that rabbit back when we're, we're all at home struggling with the VPN, boy, we would love to know. <laughs> it's okay. been a long year. <laughs> <laughs> You've done an amazing job, all things considered. <laughs> That's pretty neat. Uh, well, thank you so much. So thank you to ESIP for providing the, um, the hosting services. Um, thank you to Joe and Kenzie and Paco, and of course to, to the audience who came to attend. Um, and usually a pack, everyone's got a packed meeting schedule, so taking an hour out of your day is very much appreciated. Um, th thank you so much. Uh, that was really informative and um, just a, a neat look at this uh, great project. All right, Megan, you want to lead us out? <laughs>